The underlying biology of head and neck cancers is uh, interesting because uh, there are two main subsets. Uh, traditionally, head and neck cancers were induced by uh, carcinogens, environmental exposures such as uh, heavy uh, tobacco exposure and uh, also heavy alcohol use. And these um, uh, induced changes in the DNA, genomic alterations that led to cancer development. Uh, over the past few decades, we've recognized that another major subset across the world is the virally induced cancers. Uh, in North America and Western countries, we have human papillomavirus. Uh, in the East, Asians have uh, a high frequency of uh, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV-induced nasopharyngeal carcinomas. So it's important to distinguish uh, head and neck cancers as carcinogen-exposed or virally-induced. Head and neck cancer is quite a, a heterogeneous disease. Uh, we've uh, began to realize that uh, even more recently. Uh, the genetic drivers were actually initially characterized by identifying uh, alterations in the tumor suppressor P53. Uh, P53 uh, inactivation, usually genetically, is the most common event, genetic event, in all of human cancers, and head and neck is no different. Uh, 60 to 70 percent and perhaps more, the harder you look, of P53 uh, uh, is altered uh, in head and neck cancers. Uh, the rest, where P53 is not altered, are generally the virally induced cancers, and they inactivate P53 through non-genetic means, uh, through the expression of viral proteins. Uh, besides P53, which is the dominant genetic alteration, there are some other uh, scattered genetic mutations in some tumor suppressors, particularly in the notch pathway. Uh, that was uh, characterized uh, through a paper out of the University of Pittsburgh uh, and uh, others at MD Anderson. Um, in HPV positive head and neck cancers, interestingly, there's a relatively high frequency, perhaps half, have activating mutations in the PI3 kinase gene. Uh, and in fact, there's approximately double the PI3 kinase activating mutations in HPV positives, about 50 percent, as opposed to HPV negatives, which have about 25 percent activating uh, PI3 kinase alterations. <clears throat> now, if one looks within uh, an individual's cancer, you'll find that not every tumor cell has these genetic alterations. And so that heterogeneity is probably where we see variability in treatment response because the PI3 kinase alterations that I just mentioned may only be present uh, in a subset uh, of the cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment. And that's what we mean by heterogeneity, that there's variability uh, in, essentially when we do these genomic analyses, it's an averaging uh, across a whole tumor. And uh, we're beginning to understand that there are subpopulations that we term heterogeneity within a tumor and some of them have different genetic alterations. The heterogeneity is not just genetic, though. Uh, there are differences in the host, the immune inflammatory response to the cancer. And in a certain region of the cancer, you will see infiltrating lymphocytes and immune cells trying to perhaps recognize and target and reject the cancer cells. And in other areas of the cancer, you see no immune infiltrate, no inflammatory cells. It's really sort of a uh, inert uh, portion of the tumor. And so that sort of heterogeneity probably plays a major role in treatment response and the development of cancers uh, and prognosis. The epidermal growth factor receptor we've known about for a long time and its association with head and neck cancer, its relevance to head and neck cancer. We've known that um, higher expression of EGFR uh, is associated with a worse prognosis. And that's a worse prognosis uh, almost irrespective of how the patient's treated, whether it's surger surgery, radiation therapy, or chemotherapy. We've tried to exploit that, of course, with therapy, with uh, agents that target uh, the epidermal growth factor receptor. And what we've learned along the way is that there are tumors that uh, genomically upregulate this protein. And they do that in one of two ways, either through true EGFR amplification, so more than one copy on, of the same gene on the chromosome, or an increase in gene copy number, uh, that is uh, a replication of the uh, part of that arm of the chromosome or the entire chromosome. And both ways appear to be quite effective at increasing the protein expression.
what's interesting is that when we began to look at more and more tumors, and especially when we began to look at the differences between HPV positive and HPV negative tumors, we noticed that this gene amplification was exclusive to HPV negative tumors. It's only the HPV negatives that amplify EGFR. TCGA, of course, was really a broad attempt at molecularly profiling several cancers and, and, and eventually uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. 500 samples with uh, profiling that included uh, sequencing, that included uh, mRNA expression, that included epigenetics, and even some protein uh, expression or some proteomics. So now we have a comprehensive catalog of what squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck looks like at the molecular level. Let me first talk about some of the limitations in TCGA, and then we can talk about the relevance to clinical practice or day-to-day -day practice. One of the limitations is that because of the nature of the way the specimens were collected, there are relatively few HPV positive cancers. You have to remember that in order to submit to TCGA, one had to submit a fair amount of tumor and normal tissue with some other accompanying specimens and of course accompanying uh, data. Uh, so that really left um, the bulk of the cancers being ones, the submitted cancers being ones that were operated on. Uh, and for the most part, the primary treatment for HPV positive cancer isn't surgery, so most of the samples in TCGA are HPV negative. There are some HPV positives, and it makes up about 20% of the cohort, and, and so it's a substantial number. But we have to keep that in mind when we begin to look at the data. Uh, with all that in mind, uh, what we began to see were some really interesting findings. First of all, it became quite clear that HPV positive and HPV negative at a molecular level are distinct diseases. They, are, they share some uh, common uh, alterations, but for the most part, the alterations are different. HPV negative cancers seem to alter tumor suppressor genes, most commonly p53, p16, and FAT1, while HPV positive cancers, interestingly, the most commonly altered gene is PIK3CA in the PI3 kinase pathway. Well, what does that mean for therapy? It could mean a few things, and, and we're beginning to explore these uh, right now. We identified certainly what we call actionable alterations. So there were alterations, as I mentioned, in HPV positive cancers in P PI3 kinase. In fact, almost half, almost half of HPV positive cancers will have a genomic level alteration in the PI3 kinase pathway. And we think that would be fertile ground for future therapies, and of course that's being explored. On the HPV negative side, we found uh, a few targetable uh, uh, alterations. EGFR amplification is one, cyclin D1 amplification occurs in almost a third of HPV negative cancers, and then um, low percentages of uh, FGF receptor, uh, either mutations or alterations. Incidentally, FGF receptor alterations also occur in HPV positive cancers um, and uh, just different ones. But again, we have FGF receptor inhibitors uh, at our disposal some of them, in fact, commercially available, and those things are being studied in clinical trials right now.